Hello everyone, this is Church Online at Church on the Rise in Beaufort, Ebervale. So we welcome you to our service this evening. As you can see from the screen, we have lots of our members and attenders uh, in their own homes and we can have an enjoyable time. So we pray that you will be blessed as you listen to the service and as people take part and as we listen to the word later on. So first of all, we're going to sing together, but not online together in our own homes. And for those of you who will be listening to this broadcast, if you know the song, please sing along where you are. If you don't know the song, just listen to the words because there's a message in the words. We thank God that he is a faithful God to each one of us. So we're gonna take part together and enjoy singing together, Faithful God.
faithfulness, Father. In the middle of trouble, in the storm of uncertainty, Lord, you're the one thing we count on. Every day, your faithfulness carries us through. Well, that is true. He is our rock in times of trouble. And we thank him for being so good to his people. And so if you have found this time of pandemic and the lockdown hard, then let me assure you, the best thing you can do is to tune into God. We thank him for his goodness and his greatness with us. We're going to have a reading now, and Anwen is going to give us the reading. Thank you, Anwen. Not quite working. Okay, perhaps if you can get it to work in a short while. That'd be fine. So in the meantime, we'll have a time of prayer. So perhaps if uh, Gaina uh, can speak, uh, so perhaps you'll unmute yourself. Okay, okay Gaina, over to you. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you that you're in the midst of all our lives. It's been such a strange, strange time. But we know that you were there with each and every one of us. Yes, amen. And as Christians, Lord, it has been a time when people have turned to us. My neighbours of Gaina, will you pray for us a big prayer? So many people in so many situations. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. But we know that you are there for us mm -hmm. and you use us as your mouthpiece, Lord. And I've seen the comfort because I've held nothing back. Because at these times, Lord, to say, look towards God. He's there for you all. He'll help you through this time. And they say to me, will you pray for us? I suggest that you can pray as well. Oh, Heavenly Father. Still in praying for those people caught up in the coronavirus, Lord. Mm. Oh, those in hospital. We pray for them. We pray for their families and their friends. And for those who have passed away, Lord, we pray again for the family and friends. Oh, so, so, so sad what is happening. And pray for all those people all over the world who have yeah. other illnesses, Lord. They must not be forgotten, that you were there for them in every situation. Oh, Lord, but what a comfort we have from you. Yes. When there's been so much going on and people have said, but why? And I've said, it's in God's hands. He knows why. But out of all of this, Lord, there's sad things that have come about, but there's positivity as well. And we can see it in so many places. But Heavenly Father, thank you that you are our cornerstone, that we can be there and talk to you about anything and pray for anyone. And I've noticed the, the peace that people get when I say, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, thank you that we've been able to gather like we have tonight. So lovely to be with our brothers and sisters in you alone. Heavenly Father, thank you. And as we go on through the days, oh, all different situations coming up, Lord. But we pray as we are brought out of lockdown and, and as restrictions are eased, oh, be there for us, Lord. Let us follow the steps that we are told. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, and we love you so much for all that you do. And thank you for being in our lives. 
that we are there to help others. And I know that by saying that we will pray for them, oh Lord, what a comfort that it gives. And I thank you, Lord, and ask you to be with us, Lord. Give us the strength to help others wherever we are. And I ask this, Lord, in the precious name of your Son, dear Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Gaina. Now, Phil, you're going to pray as well. So if you unmute yourself, Phil. Still having problems? Don't worry. Perhaps we'll have the reading now. See, Gary and Anwen have been able to unmute. Carry on, try and do it, Phil, and we'll have a prayer after. We'll have a, we'll have a, a sandwich tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Anwen. The reading tonight is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not hear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks, if they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them, them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Thank you, Anwen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Phil, Thank you, so you seem to be okay, uh, so yeah, over to you in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, you, you are a God of love. You love us so much, Father, that you are faithful. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. We bless you, Father, and pray that we will learn from your word. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you will teach us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Phil. We got there in the end. Just before we have the reading, uh, Susan is going to... Uh, share with us tonight. So over to you, Susan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, right. This story is in two parts. The first part happened, I think, about 10 months ago. I'm not sure. Um, but I developed a slight twinge in my right knee. And I thought nothing of it because as you get older, you get twinges, don't you? But then it got worse and worse, and it was an intermittent pain, but I got to the stage where I needed occasionally to take painkillers for it. So Derek and I started to pray. And we prayed and prayed every day, and it seemed the more we prayed, the worse it got. And so we carried on praying anyway. And it wasn't agony like, the sort of pain that Anwin had had, but it was unpleasant and it was a daily thing and it seemed to be worse in the evenings. And it got to the stage where I thought I'd better go to the doctor. 
However, then lockdown started, so I never actually made it to the doctor. So we carried on praying and praying. And one day I thought, oh my goodness, my knee seems to be better. And it sounds ridiculous, but I don't know exactly when it was healed. <laughs> I don't think it was the day that I thought it's better, because when I thought about it, I haven't taken any painkillers, any paracetamol for a few days. So I thought, well, thank you, God, that's, that's wonderful. Now, the second story. At the same sort of time, I developed a funny hip. And it's the only way I can describe it, a funny hip. And it was my right hip. So there's a right knee and a right hip. And it was never very painful. There was a discomfort, but I found I, I couldn't move as well as usual. You know, standing up and sitting down, bending over in the garden to pick up weeds. But the worst of it was, I couldn't really get into the car because the seats are quite high up. So Derek had to shove me in. He looked very unelegant. And then one day, about a week ago, he said, do you need any help getting in the car? And I said, no, I'm sitting in the car, I'm fine. And I thought, oh my gosh, my hips healed as well. My right hip and my right knee were both healed. And as I say, I'm not quite sure when it happened, but I just want to publicly thank God for his goodness. And it wasn't a serious illness, but I'm still very grateful. So thank you, God. Amen. Thank you, Susan, for sharing that. God is interested in all the little things of our lives, isn't he? And uh, we just praise him for his goodness and uh, we thank him that uh, he's willing to do the impossible. He's willing to do those things that we forget about. Um, but then we realize he's been working behind the scenes and he can do it for you tonight. Whatever your point of need is, he's there for you. So just reach out to him, whether you're listening to this program this evening or later in the week. He's always there for us. Praise his name. So now we're going to have Paul share the word with us. So over to you, Paul. And uh, we pray God's blessing on your word. Thank you, Wayne. Um, good evening, everyone. And good evening to everyone that's listening to this broadcast. Uh, I'm going to take you back uh, rather a long way. I'm going to take you back to the time when I was a little boy growing up uh, in Neath. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a time not talking about the good old days as an old man sort of thing, but uh, I want to refer to something specific, and I'll get to that as we go along. When I was growing up, we didn't have a car. But then there were probably only about two people in our street that had a car. We didn't have a phone. And then there were probably only about two people in our street that had a phone. And when I say we were in a terrace street with about 150 houses, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, we didn't have a TV. Uh, I can remember having our first TV and the first program I saw was Coronation Street. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, it was an old TV. The screen was probably not much bigger. If you're looking at a laptop now, probably not much bigger than that screen. And when you turned it on, uh, you had to wait for the valves to warm up and a little white dot would come on in the middle of the screen and gradually get bigger until you got a black and white picture uh, and then the same reverse when you turned it off. Uh, and at the end, which I think the last program would be about eight o'clock at night, and at the end they played the national anthem and they reminded you to turn your television off so that it wouldn't catch fire and the, tele and the family wouldn't be barbecued. Um, but also, uh, some more important things that we didn't have were central heating, double glazing, triple glazing. All we had in the house for heating 
was a coal fire in one room, in the room that we called the living room. In those days, you didn't have a lounge, you had a living room. You didn't have a hall, you had a passage. And the rest of the house in the winter would be freezing. But the, the house with the coal, uh, the room rather, with the coal fire would be quite warm. But there were times when you would still feel cold, even with the coal fire lit. And uh, perhaps mum or dad would look across and see one of us, my brother or I, and they'd say, uh, what are you shivering for? Are you cold? Yes, I am. And they'd say, well, go and put another pullover on. The only thing was that you'd say, I've got to go upstairs. And going through the passage, which was dark, up uh, the stairs, which were dark, and into your bedroom, which was dark. You'd be feeling around for the light switch inside the door, and all the time you'd be frozen because you weren't in the room with the heating on. And then you'd get a pullover and you'd put it on and go down the stairs, and you'd still be cold for quite a while. And they'd say in the end, Are you still cold? Yes, ma'am come nearer the fire. And what I want to talk about this evening is that phrase. So hold it in mind as I'm speaking. Come nearer the fire. And I want to think about the text, which is the last verse of our reading this evening, Hebrews 12 and verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. The letter to the Hebrews is uh, quite an interesting letter because it was written to Jews who were struggling with their newfound Christian faith. And it was also written for any Jews who were thinking about becoming Christian believers. And the person that wrote the letter uh, tries to show them that the old and the new religions, Judaism and Christianity, were both revealed by God, but he goes on to show how Jesus is far superior to the angels, to their religious leaders, to their priests. And he goes on to show that Christianity has a better covenant, a better sanctuary, and a more sufficient sacrifice, which is the death of Jesus on the cross, of course. And then he goes on later in the letter, in chapter 11, to encourage them not to turn back from their faith, but to keep on following Jesus. And in the whole of the letter, he is giving them instructions here and there on how to live the Christian life. So he ends with this encouragement. Chapter 11, he gives a whole gallery of faith, as it's known and speaks of their forefathers, as Jewish forefathers from the Old Testament, and how they lived by faith. And he's encouraging these uh, former Jews who have now become followers of Jesus, he's encouraging them, them to live by faith. So he says, keep going on by faith. And then also, reading on, he says, keep going, because the Christian life it's like a race. And in the beginning of chapter 12, he says, you are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. In other words, all those people that I've mentioned in chapter 11 who live by faith, and you know their names and their stories because they're in your Old Testament scriptures, all those people, it's as if they're watching on and looking at you, and they're encouraging you on. But remember that you must run this race to the end. You mustn't stop and sit down halfway. You mustn't turn around and go back to the beginning and say, I've had enough of this. I'm going back to the old way. You must run the race with perseverance. How can you do that? By looking to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of your faith. And then he says, keep going because you'll need discipline and your heavenly father will keep that discipline upon you while you run the race and live the Christian life. And then he goes on 
further in chapter 12 from verses 14 to 27 he says don't refuse god always do what he says and follow his leading because others didn't do what he said and they blew it they lost it on the way and then he says keep going because as uh, was read for us earlier on god's kingdom can't be shaken you're in a kingdom that's unshakable so keep on worshiping worshiping him with reverence and with awe keep going with all these things because our god is a consuming fire now one of the images in the bible for god is that of fire and if we turn to the first kings in the old testament chapter 18 you remember the uh, prophet elijah and this is a fascinating story uh, elijah has been uh, coming up against king ahab uh, and he comes to ahab at a time um, when ahab has just about had enough of elijah who he calls the troubler of israel he's a right nuisance and he really I've had enough of this man. And Ahab's wife Jezebel has been going around killing off the Lord's prophets, it says in 1 Kings 18, verse 4. So Elijah, in meeting Ahab, is taking his life in his own hands because Ahab's life could, her wife could kill him. So Elijah comes and he says to Ahab, Look, you say, that you are God, Baal is the one. And your prophets are the ones who speak the truth. And me and the other prophets, we're all speaking lies. So what we'll do is we'll have a contest up on the mountain. You and your prophets, you have a sacrifice and I'll have a sacrifice. And the God who answers by fire he is God. And so they have a sacrifice. He said, you go first. So there's 450 prophets of Baal. They get two bulls and they get a sacrifice. They get the wood. And he says, don't set fire to it. Just call on the name of your God. And I call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. And you see if you're God will come down in fire. And so they began to call on the name of their God. And it went on and on and on through the morning. And it became noontime and Elijah began to taunt them. Shout a bit louder, perhaps he's deaf. And uh, perhaps he's busy, perhaps he's deep in thought. Perhaps he's gone on a journey, perhaps he's forgotten all about you. So they shouted louder and louder and louder and they began to cut themselves with swords and spears until their blood was flowing. And midday passed, it says, they can't continued with the frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. So they'd been going at it all day. And it says there was no response, no one answered, no one paid any attention. And then Elijah, he said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him, he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was ruined by now. And Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the, Lord, the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. And with those stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he dug a trench around it, a huge trench, he arranged the wood, and he got the sacrifice. Then he said, get some large jars of water and pour it all over the off offering and on the wood. And then he said, do it again. And then he said, do it again. So three times they poured huge jars of water all over the sacrifice, and there was a trench of water all around it. 
And at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward all on his own and he prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Listen to this. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, the stones and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Do you know what they were saying? Eli Yah, which is in Hebrew, Elijah. Because Elijah's name is, the Lord is God. El is God, and Yah is the short for Yahweh or Jehovah. The Lord is God. The people are saying, Eli, yeah, I, I, I think that's wonderful. So here you see God as the God who answers by fire. And the picture in scripture in many places, uh, the picture of God is a God who is an awesome fire. I, now, I want to think about this, this theme of coming nearer the fire. Now compare the, the flame of a candle with the flame of a raging forest fire. Some of you may remember using a candle, perhaps when you were young, I do, uh, walking around the house with a candle. It didn't give much uh, light, does it? But when you look, at a raging forest fire, those people in unfortunate parts of the world, such as Australia not so long ago, with those awful forest fires. You, I, I should imagine you could see the fire from space. There was so much light coming from it. Imagine the light, the difference with a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire and scripture says the lord is my light and my salvation whom shall i fear god is a consuming fire one of the preachers that i love to listen to i'm not actually preaching his sermon tonight this is a message the lord has given me a promise to but one of the preachers I don't know if you've heard the expression, he actually scratches where I itch. He says what I need to hear most times I hear him preach. Uh, he's an American preacher and I expect Marie, I know she listens to the God Channel a lot, and some of you do. Um, he has uh, uh, written some books and uh, devotional books, and I have one of his books, uh, on my Kindle, which I read regularly. And he has written a sentence which has stayed with me since I read it last year. He said, there is a place in God where the fire consumes every other desire in you, except the desire to know Jesus in all the power of his resurrection. I better repeat that because it's quite deep. There is a place in God where the fire consumes every other desire in you except the desire to know Jesus in all the power of his resurrection. What does that mean? Well, when you and I, Christian believers, we are walking with Jesus, and we are trying our best to live out our Christian life. We read the scriptures and we pray uh, and things don't go quite the way they should. And we miss this and we miss that. And we're not so brilliant as we think we are spiritually, perhaps. But sometimes we reach that point where we feel, goodness me, I'm so close. 
you ever get that time sometimes when you're praying and you've got your eyes shut and you feel if I open my eyes, I'd see him standing in front of me. You know, it's like that. And that's what this man is talking about. There's a place in God where the fire consumes every other desire in you except the desire to know Jesus in all the power of his resurrection. I want to get there, don't you? Do we know that place? Do we know that it exists where he says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you? Remember Isaiah, the uh, prophet, prophet, another prophet in Israel, uh, and he uh, had that experience where he saw a great vision of God in the temple, chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, if you know it. Uh, it's a well-known passage. And he saw God high and lifted up, and there were cherubim, seraphim flying around, calling, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Uh, uh, and they were praising God. But at the sound of their voices, the temple shook. Uh, uh, and um, it, I, I read what uh, Isaiah says. He cried out, woe to me. I am ruined from a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. After this, Isaiah hears his call to become a prophet to the nation. And he's told that he will have to keep on and on and on persevering prophesying, prophesying, listening to God, prophesying, being opposed, seeing things apparently fail, keep on prophesying till it seems as if everything has fallen apart and failed. But he, he goes, he says, here I am, Lord, send me. But did you notice one of the seraphs flew with a live coal in his hand? Where did you get coal from? From the fire. He brought the fire from God to touch this man's life and then send him out with the message to the nation. Come nearer the fire. We need to experience that fire. Now the man I quoted from earlier on, the preacher, who gave that great quote, he talked about our desires, our natural desires and our spiritual desires. And you and I as human beings, we have many desires, many of them are worldly and many of them are spiritual. If we are uh, Christian believers, many of them are worldly. What are yours? They may be physical urges, they may be financial desires oh i'd love to have more money they may be for things in the world oh, i'd love to have a yacht i could take off around the world and forget about it all I forget all about my worries back home i could just take off or oh, i'd love to have health good health wouldn't it be wonderful not to wake up with four or five day migraines and all the rest of it and arthritis or whatever. It would be wonderful to have great health. As Christians, we have probably some of those urges. Plus, we have spiritual desires. If you're a believer, what are your desires? Perhaps you say, oh, I'd love to be able to pray better. Or I'd love to be able to pray out loud. When I came to be pastor of a church in Tredegar 25 years ago, one of the deacons said to me, Pastor, he said, this is the first prayer meeting I took. I want you to know that I, I've never been able to pray out loud in the prayer meeting. 
and I said, oh, I, I understand, I understand. And I was the first, first a Christian, I was terribly nervous. He said, yeah, but I've been a Christian for years, Pastor. I said, okay, my friend, I pray for you. I'll go on praying for you, that the Lord will open your mouth. And one evening in the prayer meeting, sometime later, you know, you get these silences in prayer meetings sometimes, and this voice suddenly blurted out, thank you God for Jesus tonight, amen. And it was this man. And the tears rolled down my cheeks. And I said to him afterwards, that was wonderful. Praise the Lord. He said, I don't know where that came from, brother, but I, I hope I can do that again. And the following week, so this one prayed, that one prayed, another prayed. And then in the silence, this voice came. Thank you for Jesus tonight. Bless the children. Amen. And each week he would say a little bit more and a little bit more until in the end you couldn't shut him up. Because God had loosed his tongue and his prayer life had opened up. You and I sometimes, we feel my prayer life isn't deep enough. Or perhaps you want to be more like Jesus. I'd like to be more loving, more gentle, more patient, more kind, more this, more that, more like Jesus. I'd like to read the Bible and understand it more, better more and more other desires which of these would you really prefer the worldly or the spiritual and if you're a believer which of the spiritual would you really crave the most and i can't just come into the end now what what kind of god would you want to know the weak wishy-washy god of the religious people look where the god has got them dwindling congregations empty crumbling buildings you can go around and see them or they've been converted into homes garages mini supermarkets all kinds of things no if we're real believers we want to know the living god who's a consuming fire we want to build living churches in his name, full of believers who've been filled with the Holy Spirit, passionate to be witnesses, to bring others to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And who knows, maybe if we come nearer the fire, we may catch some of the fire and become those kind of believers with that passion for souls, that passion for Jesus, that passion to see the church built in his name. Are you up for that? Oh, let us be up for that. There's a place in God where the fire consumes every desire in you, except the desire to know all the power of Jesus and his resurrection. Our God is a consuming fire. Will you come nearer the fire? Can I get nearer the fire? Oh, thank God for Jesus tonight. To him be the glory. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Such an encouraging word. And the invite is there tonight to come closer to the fire. God is there. He's only a prayer away. And if you need him tonight, then we want to be able to help you to find him, to find the God who can change your life. And so if you are listening to this program and you want to know more, if you want some prayer, then please get in touch. Mm. At the end of this video program, there is some details where you can make contact with us. And if you want to commit your life to God, then we will be privileged to help you to do that. We also want to give you a little booklet called This Is For You. 
And so we'd be glad, glad to send it to you. So we praise God. So as we close this program with a, another hymn, it's a hymn that we don't often sing, but it has some tremendous words. So let's join together as we bring this service to an end. And then perhaps, Derek, will you close in prayer for us later? So let's just sing this song together. Make sure it's connected. wonderful words the deep love of jesus for each one of us over to you derek as you close in prayer for us let us pray heavenly father we've just heard that last hymn and just how much that your wounds have 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 
without doubt brought about our salvation. And we've heard in the word today about the situation of the consuming fire. And we do pray, Lord, that everyone who has listened to this broadcast, whether live tonight or later on during the week, that they will take on board what has been said this evening and that our whole life can be consumed by you except for the one thing that your love for us is so overwhelming the fire will put out all the problems that we've had because we will be able to focus our lives purely on you focus our lives our everyday lives as we walk around doing the things that we do as we go to work as we play as we rest that you just consume us and let us focus on what you and who you are that you are the god who loves us all so unconditionally and we just give thanks lord for the word tonight for the prayers we just pray love to everyone in your name we pray amen amen, amen. amen. so thank you folks thank you church and the rise for joining us and thank you for all those who will be listening to this program so you can all unmute yourself and say your farewells to everybody Steve, have a lovely time, and Anne, down in the caravan. We intend to. Thank you. Yeah, all the best. Yeah, they can hear you now. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. 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 All the very best. Bye. 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 Have a good week, everyone. Bye, Steve, Anne. Bye, everyone. Okay, go in, go in. Bye. Bye.